Piri Reis himself told us that knowledge was not his knowledge. It was knowledge that he'd borrowed and copied from earlier maps. And he stated on the map that it was based on more than 20 source maps and that some of these maps went back to the time of Alexander the Great or even earlier, in other words, to before the time of Christ. So the mystery is, where did these source maps come from? Who charted the globe long ages ago with an accuracy that we ourselves can hardly match today? Antarctica has long been considered as one of the most remote places on our planet due to its extreme climate. However, Antarctica isn't only ice. In fact, there is more to Antarctica than we have knowledge of today. With its 14 million square kilometers, Antarctica is the fifth largest continent on our planet, and in other words, is twice the size of Australia. It turns out that in the distant past of our planet, Antarctica was much more different than we see it today. In fact, the icy continent was located much more north in the distant past, meaning that the now icy continent was ice-free in the past. Interestingly, some 170 million years ago, Antarctica was part of the supercontinent called Gondwana. Around 25 million years ago, Antarctica, as we know it, gradually broke apart from Gondwana. Researchers have concluded that Antarctica was not always cold, dry, and covered in ice sheets. In fact, during its long history, when Antarctica was located farther north and the continent experiences a tropical or temperate climate, meaning that it was covered in forest and inhabited by various ancient life forms. But is there a slight possibility that in the distant past of our planet, Antarctica was home of ancient civilizations? Many have speculated for decades that icy continent was home to ancient civilizations before written history. The story behind Antarctica is more than fascinating as there are a number of indicators which point to the possibility that the continent was occupied by ancient civilizations. The Antarctic ice sheet covers 98% of the continent and contains more than half of the world's fresh water. But it doesn't just sit there like a giant ice cube. Much of the ice is constantly flowing toward the sea under the force of its own weight. Measuring the thickness of the Antarctic ice sheet, more than three kilometers thick in some places, and mapping the topography of the underlying bedrock helps us understand how the ice flows and ultimately how much it might contribute to sea level rise. An international consortium of scientists led by the British Antarctic Survey recently released an updated map of the bedrock that lies beneath the ice sheet. This map, named Bedmap 2, builds on an earlier map that they'd released in 2001, and in together, these measurements will improve scientists' understanding of the evolving Antarctic ice sheet and its influence on the surrounding ocean and our global climate, and will enhance scientific understanding of the continent. And navigators and seafarers need maps if they're going to sail around the Earth. Now this map is a modern map, and I picked it up at the Library of Congress in the United States. It's an azimuthal equidistant projection centered near Cairo. And in common with all modern maps, it incorporates a number of advanced features. It incorporates highly accurate longitudes and particularly relative longitudes, and it incorporates an advanced map projection. It isn't easy to represent a spherical object, the Earth, on a flat piece of paper and to do so with a considerable degree of accuracy. And this is a problem that cartography has had to overcome. So we find good map projections which require advanced mathematics and good relative longitudes. Interestingly enough, 
There's a category of ancient map which also shows these modern features and which doesn't fit with the received view of the development of human history. One of the most famous of these maps is the Piri Reis map. Um, and I'm showing it uh, here because I want to compare the projection of this map with the projection here, centered on Cairo. Notice the west coast of Africa and the east coast of South America. And coming down here to, to the Antarctic Peninsula, tonguing up towards the south of South America. It's uh, that precise projection that we find on this 1513 map. Again, there's the west coast of Africa, the east coast of South America. And coming down here, we find a representation of the northern Antarctic Peninsula. In 1513, when Piri Reis uh, drew the map, Antarctica had not been discovered. Uh, in fact, it wasn't discovered until 1880 by our civilization. Uh, so there immediately is one anomaly on this map. And another anomaly is the uh, mathematics used in the map projection. And a third anomaly is that it incorporates highly accurate relative longitudes. To do longitudes accurately on maps requires a chronometer, a marine chronometer that will keep accurate time at sea. And again, this was something that our civilization couldn't do until the late 18th century. So this map fragmentary though it is, uh, appears to incorporate many features that are not supposed to have been known about in 1513. Piri Reis explains why in these texts that he wrote on the map. He was a Turkish admiral and he wrote these texts on the map. But what they say is that the map is not his own work. It's a, it's a work of synthesis. It's based on more than 20 earlier source maps. Uh, that he put all these maps together and derived his own map from these. And unfortunately, the source maps that Piri Reis used have not survived. Is it possible that the advanced features of this map uh, originate in those lost source maps, which Piri Reis told us went back in some cases to before the time of Christ and had come from the long lost library of Alexandria in Egypt? Another strange thing about the appearance of Antarctica on this map, uh, it's been studied by US Air Force cartographers, and their view uh, is that what we're actually seeing there is the subglacial topography of Antarctica. Antarctica as it looks underneath the ice that now covers it. And this raises the question, how long has Antarctica been covered with the two mile thick ice cap that we now presently see on it? Such questions would be irrelevant if there were no other maps in this category. If the Piri Reis map stood alone, the most sensible thing to do would be to dismiss it as a coincidence. But it doesn't stand alone. There's hundreds of other maps that incorporate this same information at a time when our civilization had not yet acquired that information. Uh, this is the Mercator map. Mercator is rather famous for his Mercator projection that still dominates most atlases today. It's a 16th century map, and um, it shows Antarctica 300 years before Antarctica was discovered. And again, it's based on earlier source maps, and again, it incorporates accurate relative longitudes. So also the Orontius Phineas map that we're looking at here, another 16th century map. Mercator includes it in one of his atlases. And here we see Antarctica looking a little bit different with mountains clearly visible along the coast and rivers running down from those mountains in places where great glaciers are known to run today. It looks on this map as though Antarctica is partially deglaciated. The center of the continent appears to be featureless and ice covered, but the coast is showing these unglaciated features. What might that mean? This is a map by Philippe Bouache, uh, an 18th century geographer, still a good hundred years before the discovery of Antarctica. And it shows the continent as a kind of archipelago, two major land masses divided by a clear waterway running between them. I wonder where he got that idea from. There's a redrawing of the Mercator map and the Orontius Phineas map and the Buash map. And here to the right, based on seismic surveys conducted in International Geophysical Year in 1958, is a view of what Antarctica actually looks like underneath all that ice that now covers it. We're looking at the subglacial landscape of Antarctica here. 
And while I wouldn't claim for a moment that the Bouache map is a perfectly accurate representation of the subglacial topography of Antarctica, I think it's much too close to the reality uh, to be dismissed entirely. I think that much more research needs to be done into these anomalous early maps and into the source maps that they rely upon for their information because we just may be looking at the faint fingerprints of a lost civilization, of a navigating, seafaring civilization that explored and mapped the entire globe long before what we call history began. The issue of the glaciation of Antarctica is a controversial one, and most scholars would say that it has been covered with ice uh, in the form that we see it today for several millions of years. But there is some contradictory evidence, deep sea cores which bring up uh, soils from the ocean bed, uh, which suggest that rivers carrying fine-grained sediments were indeed running down off the coastline of Antarctica until about 10,000 years ago. Maybe that's the period we should be looking at. Maybe something happened in the world around then that we don't fully understand. And in my view, this whole mystery is intimately connected to the mystery of the last ice age and what an ice age is and why the last ice age came suddenly and traumatically to an end at around 12 or 14,000 years ago. You have ice sheets, six million square miles of ice covering northern Europe, two miles thick as far south as London. You have a similar mass of ice covering much of North America as far south as the Mississippi Delta, almost into the tropics. This ice is stable for a hundred thousand years. And then suddenly, almost in the blink of an eye, it all melts. Within just a thousand or two thousand years, it's all gone. Sea levels have gone up by 400 feet around the world and hundreds of animal species have been rendered extinct. No complete explanation for why the last ice age came so suddenly and dramatically to an end has ever been offered by orthodox scholarship. There are clear correlations with astronomical events, including, interestingly, the precession of the equinoxes, which I'll be talking about later. Interestingly, because many of the ancient myths of global cataclysm uh, that I've analyzed in Fingerprints of the Gods incorporate precise information on precession it's almost as though they're trying to tell us that there's a connection between precession and the ending of ice ages. And uh, lo and behold, we've known for the last 20 years that there is a connection between precession and the end of ice ages. It's a correlation. We don't know what causes this ending of the ice age. I think that this is the period that should be looked at by scholars. This is the period that deserves much more detailed research than it's had. A period in, in which something awful happened to the earth. Something that brought about a dramatic, tumultuous change. A period in which the face of the earth was almost literally wiped clean. And a period in which it's perfectly possible, perfectly reasonable to suppose that a high human civilization could have been almost entirely obliterated leaving only a few survivors and only a few traces of itself for us to wonder at in later. It's no doubt that the Flat Earth Movement has been used as a psychological operation with a purpose of division. However, that does not discount the fact that it is based on truth. Over a hundred years ago, the Hawaiian Gazette published a story about a map that was made in the 10th century. This newly discovered map is drawn on the principles of the Mercator projection, echoes the current accepted flat earth model, as well as the UN flag. However, there is one significant difference, and that is that our dome is surrounded by dozens of islands. Reputed to be drawn by Chinese priests, the manuscript was hidden away from authorities for centuries. However, a letter found claims that the map was actually drawn by Buddhist priests much earlier in time. The article goes on to read, The map was found by my brother in a Japanese temple in the mountains of Japan, said Dr. Kabayashi. 
It has been hidden from the Japanese government in modern times, just as it was in ancient times. For in olden days, such a map would have been destroyed by the authorities. This begs the question, why would the authorities be so concerned about a map that they would destroy it? So what is the truth about where we live? Do we live on a globe, flying through space? Do we live inside of a dome? Are we living on an endless plane? Or are there dozens of civilizations watching and waiting for us to remember who we are and where we come from? Formed in 1879, and with the help of the ever-expanding American Empire, they quickly became the pre premier map makers of the known world. Currently, they have around 9,000 employees and an annual budget of over a billion dollars a year. They also have extensive science departments covering biology, geography, geology, hydrology, and many programs tied to them. Their motto since the 1990s has been science for a changing world and I'm gonna show you how true that really is what does this large really boring government group have to do with the flat earth to understand that you have to look into their origins which is in geography to do this you'll need to open another page that specializes in maps the maps you see in this video are from Wikipedia but there are others you can reference as well the wiki list of map projections isn't much to look at as a whole, although there are a number of interesting takes on the world view. Not only do they have just about every perspective when it comes to the land we live on, but some detailed information on where the map originated, including name type, the origin or creator, and the year the map perspective was proposed. Now some of these will be very familiar, especially the ones that you would see on your classroom wall. There are a number of variations here, but the one that has been debated on recently would be this one, the Gauls Peters, which accurately shows the size difference between the continents, the most obvious clue being that the white continent of Greenland is actually tiny compared to Africa. But I digress. If you keep going down through all the different shapes, you'll get into circular maps, but only one of these is a top-down perspective that shows the continents in the center surrounded by an unbroken ring of ice. In wiki, it's called the azimuthal equidistant. And just to make it easier, I'm going to abbreviate and call it AE for short. Why is this map so interesting? Well, if you're looking at the wiki page, you'll spot a few reasons. The first is that in the notes section of the map, and I quote, used by the USGS in the National Atlas of the United States. It also mentions that it is used as the emblem of the United Nations. Of all the maps on this screen, it is the only one that references a group of any kind. And if you keep this page open and navigate over to the Flat Earth section of Wiki, you'll notice towards the bottom of the page a similar map. I've referenced it here, and you can tell quite easily it's identical, but not referenced or linked as the AE model. To make things even more strange, we go back to the USGS model and you see that it was first proposed a thousand years ago and you may think, well, that's a bad link. So you compare it with the person who proposed it and you get this guy, Al Biruni. Who was Al Biruni? Well, he lived around a thousand years ago and was considered one of the greatest scholars of his era, schooled in multiple sciences. Have you ever heard of him? I hadn't. Maybe it's multiple bad references in Wiki. Well, no, because NASA knows who he is and named this moon crater after him. So why is the USGS using a version of the world map designed by a thousand-year-old Persian scientist? Because it's correct. That's why. So to be clear, let's compare them again. The United Nations flag the USGS official map of the Earth, and the Flat Earth model. All identical, 
but one isn't recognized and instead ridiculed as an outdated look at the world. And this is one of those political quandaries that the authority gets stuck in. The short version is this. The government is on the same page as the flat earth, but they can't admit it, even in confidence. We know the earth isn't flat, they say, but it really is. We know you use the same map as we do, but ours is just an image. And anyone who says differently is obviously crazy. It makes you wonder how long the USGS has been using that model as an official reference. The United Nations started using it for their logos in 1945, 